Thank you for clicking It's Starting Now. Hey, um, well, I hope you had a great day yesterday. And uh, by the way, there's a, uh, a perfect run through that Rich did immediately after the show. He went back to the office, ran it through, no crashes, no nothing. It's up on YouTube. Uh, and by the way, that's a dedication of Rich. Is 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 like, okay, I'm gonna get it done properly, and he did it, and it looks great, and it doesn't have any screen tearing because there was some screen tearing. There was a technical glitch in the setup yesterday. So anyway, so anyway, watch that. And if you're doing comparisons to the old stuff, compare with that video, not not from the stream. Um, but anyway, I hope you guys liked this morning. There was. The base building and the crafting and the ships you'll be able to do it. I mean, for me, the ability to sort of create your own place somewhere in the verse, find the perfect spot for you to make your home or harvest resources, uh, it totally changes the dynamic of what the game will be in terms of exploration and people spreading out and I think putting roots down in the verse. So I can't wait till we get that in there. I mean, that's one of the things that makes me incredibly excited, because I, I think it will just add so much to a living, breathing universe. Um, but that is a perfect example of Star Citizen, how it's grown over the last 12 years, because we definitely did not have that on the initial Kickstarter or the pitches that we were doing. Um, and, you know, Star Citizen is a living game. I mean, we're constantly always adding content and features and tech. As you can see, we're constantly upgrading, you know, what we're doing on the graphics side, making it better and always improving it. And even after we would consider it a released or a ship game, not an alpha game, we will still be doing that. So it's just a, it will be a living game. We'll never do Star Citizen 2.0. It will always be sort of Star Citizen that will continue to grow. It won't be like, oh, we're going to do Destiny 2 after Destiny 1. It will just be a living, <laughs> growing product. <laughs> Same for us. Right? I don't mean that I don't mean that as a I don't mean that as a knock at them. I'm just I just mean that <clears throat> in today's world you you constantly upgrade and improve things. Um, but the the big question really is at what point would we at CIG, what point would I, what point would the rest of the team consider Star Citizen ready for everybody, not just you guys out here who are beautiful, wonderful, early adopters, willing to put up with bugs, jankiness, uh, you know, not a great new player experience. We know all those things are things that we want to fix and improve, and we want a game that everyone can just get into at the beginning, understand it, have fun, you know, pulls you into it, and then has a huge amount of depth. So the question is, what is that? Uh, and that is what we call Star Citizen 1.0. It's something that we've been talking and looking and designing and thinking a lot about over the past X number of years. And now we thought, you know what? What we should do, because I think half our sort of initial stuff is from a long time ago that you've seen, and then occasionally we'll talk about things we're doing in, uh, you know, inside Star Citizens or SE Lives. But we're like, OK, let's tell everyone the marker. This is what it is, Star Citizen 1.0. When we hit this, this is what we consider. We're ready to go wide. You know, Everybody in the world can get in, play it, whether you're hardcore or casual, have fun, play in the verse, interact, have a great time. And so that is what we're going to tell you today, is what we consider Star Citizen 1.0. That doesn't mean, as I said, that we'll stop at that point. <laughs> we'll continue to grow and build and add things. So fishing is not on Star Citizen 1.0's list. But I'm pretty sure, I know, but I'm pretty sure it will be not that long after 1.0. But that is the example. We're going to tell you what the marker is. And uh, you know, to do that, Rich Tyra, who's our senior uh, game director, is going to come out with a few of our other directors. And we'll lead you through what 1.0 will be. So without further ado. Rich Tyra. All right, Rich. Don't crash. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, CitizenCon. 
So, my name is Rich Tyra, and I'm the Senior Game Director for Star Citizen and Squadron 42. Now, I've been at Cloud Imperium for many years, and I've read many, many Spectrum and Reddit posts. <laughs> and one consistent question I always see is, what type of game is Star Citizen? And I've read many, many answers. It's a PvE game. It's a PvP game. What about non-combat? Ultimately, it's all three. Three types of players, one universe. So how do we connect those players to create a cohesive game, and not just a set of features bolted together? And it comes back to that elegant, simple question. What type of game is Star Citizen? Well, today, we're going to find out. OK, so before we get stuck into Star Citizen 1.0, I think I need to clarify a few things. Firstly, what about 4.0? Where does that fit in? Well, 4.0 is the patch that contains server meshing and pyro. And fundamentally, it's an alpha development patch, which means it's adding further tech, features, and content to our alpha version of the game. Today, though, is beyond 4.0, all the way to 1.0. And the big difference is that 1.0 is the full release of the game. OK, so what does that mean? How will it be different to a normal patch? Well, firstly, let's look at the 1. The 1 means we're committing to higher base performance and minimal bugs. No longer will we reference that the game is in development. This will be a fully released and polished experience. It means fully rounded gameplay loops from new player experience to story missions and end game content. And crucially, it means no more resets between patches. It's a true. It's a true persistent universe. So if that's the one, what about the dot zero? Well, it's just as important. It means we're still committed to continued development with new content and features being planned post 1.0. But those features will no longer be tier zero. We'll be committing to a higher benchmark of quality for each pass, each patch, and most importantly, it's a moment in time. If there is a content, feature, or star system that we've mentioned in the past that is not in 1.0, it just means it will come later. 1.0 is more than just a number change. It's the beginning of a new phase of development of the game. OK, so we know what the one is and the dot zero, but before we move on, I want to address one important point. And for this, we need to go all the way back to the beginning. Here we are, the Kickstarter. As a backer myself, it brings back memories. And it also reminds me we had a lot of stretch goals. And one of those goals was 100 star systems. But, and there is a but, the star systems of old are not the star systems of today. They were based on the privateer and freelancer model. They were unexplorable planets with an isolated and small landing zone and had automated landings. And we all know how that went. To give you an idea, Stanton had four points of interest, and the entire 100 systems only had 90 POIs. Compare that to Stanton today, and we have 1,626 points of interest, and that is going to be dwarfed once we start using the Starchitect tool you saw yesterday. So where does that leave us for 1.0? Well, we will not be launching with 100 star systems, because the game we have today was not just the game that was pitched back then. It's more rich, it's more diverse, and fundamentally, you'll be getting a whole lot more, and I mean a lot more. OK, so now I've defined what 1.0 is. Let's get into the cool stuff. Star Citizen, by its very nature, is a sandbox MMO. Today, you as a player have to find the fun. 
You have to figure out what you can do and how to do it. If you want to be a hauler or salvager, you have to know those professions exist. You have to know what ships support that gameplay. And you have to rely on outside resources for help. As it is now, the game is not set up to help you. So we're going to add a soft framework, a nervous system, that connects all the professions, ships, and content together. And to do this, we're going to add a main story. To help... <laughs> to help new and existing players, to help discover all the exciting features and content we have, to take them on a journey of discovery of what the game has to offer. This story will become the spine of the universe and help onboard players with understanding how to play the game and understand what's available to them. This story will also introduce each of our guilds and what professions we have to offer. Like the United Resource Workers, our core industrial guild, which supports two of our main professions, mining and salvaging. They also support many other features and professions, like repair technician, crafter, and builder. Guilds are hugely important in Star Citizen, and as you know by now, guilds are comprised of many factions. As you work for each of these factions, you will gain guild reputation. You can then use this reputation as a currency to purchase guild-affiliated rewards, like ships, blueprints, and items. And each guild will have a unique inventory of what they offer. Alongside economic growth, guild reputation will become a core progression of the game. And to talk more about guilds and our main story, I'd like to introduce David Haddock onto the stage, our very own narrative director. Thank you, Rich. Hello, Citizen Khan. How's it going? Awesome. So, yes, 1.0 is very exciting, and it's going to provide us probably our first real opportunity to finally inject a massive amount of narrative into the game. But we're looking to do that in several of ways. Now, Rich introduced the main story, so let's get into it. What exactly is that? First, it's a narrative experience. This will be a crafted story through the star systems and professions of the Star Citizen universe, taking players on an exciting adventure that will finally kick off the growing tension between Earth and Terra. Yeah, yeah. It will be NPC-driven. So while Squadron 42 will always be the place to go for AAA cinematic adventure, we're bringing a lot of the techniques that we learned from that to capture and build a cast of dynamic characters, some of which may be familiar, for both this story and the PU. And the main story is also designed to be sort of like a tour bus structure where you can hop on and hop off at any time you want to. So we're not also requiring you to do it. So if you want to log in day one and just go off and do your thing, you can do that. Or maybe you want to put the story on hold so you can go explore a new facet of gameplay that you just discovered. Go for it. The point is that you can complete it at your own pace. So that's the what. So why do you want to do this? What's the motivation to want to go on this ride? Like Rich said, for new players, it's a great way to ease into sort of the vast lore that we've been developing over 12 years. The gameplay, the locations that the game has to offer, and also give you a sense of up sto upcoming stories that are about to come. But you all, you've been playing Star Citizen for years. You probably know the lore better than me. So what's in it for you? Now, of course, we'll have rewards along the way as you complete missions and whatnot, but we're finally going to offer a big prize for completing the story. Citizenship. So, for many of you already know this, but for the uninitiated in the UEE, there are citizens and there are civilians. Citizens are members of the population who have demonstrated a commitment to bettering the empire 
and as such are given benefits that civilians just don't have. Now, what those, those uh, differences have been, have been debated in the community over years. 1.0, we're finally going to answer that debate. I won't get into the full list of benefits that we're going to offer, but can reveal that one of them will be around land ownership. Citizens will be able to purchase land anywhere in the UEE and enjoy the security that comes with it. But civilians will have a couple of restrictions as to which systems and which planets they can buy on. So that's the why. So where is this adventure going to take you? Well, 1.0 is going to include five star systems. This story is going to weave you through all of them, but where exactly are you going to go? First, we've got Stanton, which needs very little introduction. Uh, I'm sure you're all very intimately familiar with these four corporate-run worlds. But since I do lore, I figure I could take the next hour and just walk through each one of these. But I'm kidding. Uh, we've also got Pyro, Land of the Lawless, a volatile star at the center of the system is the perfect metaphor for the constant struggle between the gangs and survivors trying to hack out an existence here. If you saw Ian's location presentation yesterday, then you know that he reintroduced Nick's system. There's another unclaimed system that's currently home to the People's Alliance, a wannabe independent government formed during the Messer era, but now struggling with the burdens of governance, a growing outlaw presence, and a new threat on their doorstep from Vandal Raids. Ian also made another big announcement of our fourth system, Castra. Situated along the former Perry Line, this was a key strategic system to launch an attack if the Cold War between the humans and the Xion ever escalated. So that's four. Do you guys want to know five? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're finally doing it. Considered by many to be the new jewel of the empire, Terra has been a shining star against the more imperialistic tendencies of Earth, even in the darkest days of the Messer regime. Now, many believe that Terra should be the new center of the UEE. I don't know how you all feel about that. Yeah, a lot of, a lot of division. But that's our starting five. Each system and each planet will be featuring the massive level of outposts, POIs, stations, biomes, and exploration options that we've been perfecting with Stanton and Pyro, and you've been seeing in some of the other presentations this weekend. But we're adding one more level. We're also going to be adding location stories. Now, these will be short, NPC-driven missions sprinkled across our landing zones and cities that will exist outside of the main story but will help provide an additional bit of lore and character to the location that they take place in. So, that's our main story. Let's talk more about the guilds that Rich mentioned. First, a quick recap. Guilds act as a governing body for clusters of professions and factions with a reputation and progression system that will offer rewards the more you work for them. And I want to call out two things. One, I'm not going to have time to dive into all of the missions that you're going to see on this board. But just know that every mission type is either in the 1.0 roadmap or already in production. And second, we're also looking to move missions away from the Moby Glass whenever possible. Sure, it will always be an easy way for us to get additional game content in, but we want you talking with people. So, so to aid that, we're going to be adding characters to represent the factions that you'll be working for that will help sell their personality. Now, some, they'll still interact with you via the written word, but some will call and check in on your performance. And others, you may have to meet in person from time to time. So, let's walk through them. Here we have the first guild that Rich showed, the United Resource Workers. Whether you're eager to earn credits, mining valuable resources from remote corners of the universe, sifting through detritus to try and salvage some valuable components, or even just acting as a technician. You'll find plenty to do with employers like Shubin Interstellar, United Wayfarers Club, and more. Next, you have one of the oldest unions in the UEE, the Interstellar Transport Guild. This will be the go-to place for everybody looking to make their fortune hauling and trading. 
some of the factions that many of you already work for now, such as Ling Family Hauling, Redwind, and FTL. And we're going to be adding something special for the daredevils out there, the Imperial Sports Federation. So aside from the usual racetracks that are both legitimate and illegitimate, we're actually going to be leveraging some of our existing mechanics to build new sports and provide an outlet for all you Murray Cup enthusiasts, cargo Olympians, and competitors to see just who's the best out there. For those who dream of exploring, I'm sure we have a couple here. We have the Academy of Sciences that was brought up yesterday in the social uh, presentation, if you saw that. This is a science guild that will include factions like the Imperial Cartography Center, who will task you with a variety of missions to better understand our universe, such as sending you into a nebula to do deep scans, or finally seeing what's at the bottom of that planetary canyon. We're going to have a new faction called High Point Wilderness Specialists, who will offer missions associated with the various fauna that we're starting to get into the game, from population control missions to harvesting specific resources for research. Now, I don't know if we have some people who'd like to do combat, but our combat guilds were doing something a little different. Now, previous to this, these were all of our profession guilds. But for our combat guilds, they operate a little differently. See, these two are diametrically opposed to each other. So once you pledge allegiance to one, the other marks you as an enemy. On the lawful side, we have the mercenary guild. They represent factions like Eckhart Security, the Bounty Hunters Guild, and even some military contractors. So whether you're pulling, you're pulling together a team of specialists to go assault a ground base, hunting down an elusive criminal, or putting together a recon run to drum up some intel, mercenary guilds got you covered. On the flip side, we have the Council. Now this is a shadowy group comprised of representatives from various gangs, syndicates, and outlaws who mandate criminal activity throughout the verse. You'll be able to throw in with rough-and-tumble gangs like the Headhunters and the Dead Saints, or work your way up to join highline criminal syndicates like the Atonis or the Drop Kings. But remember, the underworld is a dangerous place run by greed and power. So mercenary guild reps might not be the only people you have to worry about, as the syndicates are always looking for loyal soldiers who will hurt their competition and tip the scales of power in their favor. So as you can see, there's going to be a universe of exciting storytelling opportunities for you to undertake in 1.0. But one more thing, we're also going to revitalize our social behaviors to make the populations not only feel more alive and reactive and off chairs, but better reflect the tone and flavor of the areas that they're inhabiting. We want to see the people of Lorville slowly trudging through the streets, overburdened by the ruthless contracts, just as much as we want to see the tourists of Orison gleefully moving from attraction to attraction. And all of this, this is what's going to make Star Citizen be the experience we set out to make. A diverse universe with a rich tapestry of stories, characters, and experiences for you to live in. To talk more about how all this feeds back into player progression, I'm going to turn it back over to Rich Tyre. Thanks, Dave. Smashed it. Thanks, Dave. Okay. So we have a main story to connect the universe. We have all the guilds and their associated professions. And we have location stories to give the world depth and life. Crucially, though, we have a new core progression in the game. Guild reputation. But what about our other core progression in the game? the economy. So, as we've discussed before, we'll be implementing a star sim powered dynamic economy that will automatically adjust the in-game prices based on player activity. Yeah. But for credits to actually matter though, we need to have an economy where credits flow out as well as in. This means transactions such as repairing, refueling, and restocking need to have value. If everything is too cheap and the money coming into the economy is too great, we'll have massive inflation. 
And this is where taxes and insurance come in. Boo! <laughs> We'll have two main taxes, inheritance tax as part of death of a spaceman, and security tax for your base that will cover the cost of planetary shield tech. Insurance, on the other hand, will be split between medical insurance, which covers your hospital imprints, and probably the most important one of all, ship insurance. Now, as we have death of a spaceman, we also need death of a spaceship. Losing your ship should be significant. Right now, for example, over 90% of all claims in the verse are for ships that have not been destroyed. <laughs> and this is where ship insurance and our new warranty mechanic comes in. First up, we'll have three tiers of insurance, with level one being chassis insurance. Level two, chassis and component insurance. And level three, chassis, component, and decorations insurance. Now, insurance by itself will only pay out credits based on the wear and age of your ship. Insurance. I think you, you want to listen to this bit because it's important. <laughs> Insurance with a warranty, though, will give you back a new ship, plus any other equipment or decorations based on the tier of insurance you had. OK, so this is the bit you need to listen to. All ships bought on the pledge store will come with a permanent warranty and their appropriate insurance. This means you will always get your ships back if they're attributed to your account. Other ships, on the other hand, will require a transferable warranty, and these are rare. You'll be able to earn transferable warranties in-game, such as by completing the main story, as an example, and apply them to any of the ships you own. But there will be a cooldown for transferring it between ships, so choose wisely. Now, what about claim timers? It's another fun topic. And getting your ship back without a claim. Well, we want claim timers to be proportional to the crafting timers. This means it's more beneficial for you to go back and get your original ship. For this, we're going to be introducing a shuttle ship, just like a courtesy car. You'll be able to claim the shuttle at no extra cost to most locations and then fly it back to your original ship. Once back in your ship, the shuttle will automatically return home. If your ship has been legitimately lost, though, then you'll need to claim it back. And as we'll be increasing claim timers, this will mean some ships will take longer than others. With starter or small ships always being readily available. And larger capital-sized ships taking a long time. So it's always better to try and get your ship back if possible. OK, so we've talked about our two core progressions. But what does that mean to you as a player? Well, firstly, it means we have a framework where we can start creating cyclical gameplay loops. But what are they? Let me show you. OK, so right now in live, if you have a prospector, you probably enjoy mining. And the reward for mining is credits and the enjoyment of the activity. But in 1.0, you might be mining for a whole different reason. And this is where cyclical gameplay loops come in. Firstly, Let's add all the manufacturers and ships in. I'll just give you a moment to take that in, because there's a lot. I actually had to ask them to take the variants out, because it didn't fit on this slide. And let's zoom all the way into the prospector, a stalwart of the mining community. 
But let's say I really fancy acquiring a military Mark II Hornet. Let's go on a simplified journey of how I could get one. Firstly, I know I won't be able to buy it, as it's a military ship, so I'm going to need to craft it. That means I will need the fabrication hangar blueprint. Luckily, I can earn it by doing mining missions to gain rep with the United Resource Workers, and I already have the perfect ship, my trusty prospector. With blueprint in hand and some excess credits, I can now purchase a small plot of land on Stanton and build my fabrication hangar. Step one, complete. Now I need to grab the Mark II Hornet blueprint. For this, I need mercenary rep, and more importantly, a combat ship. With that in mind, I will do a few more mining contracts to earn enough credits to purchase a Mustang from the dealership. Now I can start doing combat pilot missions for the mercenary guild, so I can unlock the Mark II Hornet blueprint. OK, step two of our simplified loop is complete. I have the Mark II blueprint, but I need the resources to craft it. So I come full circle back to my prospector, but this time I'm mining for resources instead. As you can see, this closes the loop. No longer am I mining just because I like it, and there's nothing wrong with that, but now I am mining for a purpose and for multiple reasons. For credits, for reputation, for resources, for blueprints, and ultimately as a stepping stone to crafting my own ships to enjoy other professions. And this is just one of many loops. This is the core of Star System 1.0. Player set goals that weave between sandbox gameplay and the soft framework we are adding that give meaning and progression to our professions and features. It's providing the framework for motivation to play the game. That's the journey, though. What about the destination? So Dave has already discussed citizenship and the main story, so let's collapse that for now. Let's talk about endgame content. The content that is designed for experienced players and keeps them engaged. Basically, everyone in this room. <laughs> so how does that look in 1.0? Firstly, we'll have open world content, including missions, group missions, and server-wide events, like we have today, but tailored to end game players. While the sandbox element of Star Citizen will allow for large-scale battles, we also want to provide challenging instanced content that will take full advantage of not only multi-crew ships, but fleets of ships. And you kind of know how we do that, right? You saw that yesterday. <laughs> and as you progress through the guilds, you'll be able to accept high-level contracts from government agencies who will offer prototype and military blueprints as rewards. These missions will require the full coordination of multiple players and an assorted fleet of capital, support, and fighter ships. You will finally be able to become the Admiral of the Fleet, directing your armada from your hollow globe, which, yes, is a feature included in 1.0. We will also be offering more specialized on-foot missions that see you enter the depths of distribution centers and municipal works in small, tight-knit squads that provide an outlet for our more FPS-focused players. On top of all this, we'll set a dynamic layer powered by StarSim. While StarSim will be the driving force in our dynamic economy, it will also track player and AI activity and dynamically spawn events based on their actions. For example, if it tracks large amounts of resources being moved from one home location to another, it will have a chance to spawn pirates to intercept. All this combined will provide just a portion of the end game experience. And I'd love to delve deeper, but that's for another day, as we still have a lot to show. So we've discussed non-combat professions and guilds, cyclical gameplay loops, and end game PvE content. But what about PvP? Yeah. What about player versus player content? As you know, 1.0 will contain five star systems. 
three of these being lawful in Stanton, Castra, and Terra, and two of them being unlawful in Pyro and Nix. So what's the difference? Let's take a look at Stanton. Lawful systems will be a mixture of high, medium, and low security areas. Each of these areas will be monitored by law enforcement agencies. And depending on the location, will dictate the emergency response time, with high-sec areas being the fastest. Initially, this response will be measured, but over time will escalate to overwhelming force. This means if someone is attacked, if they can just hold out for a short duration, help will be on the way. Pirates will be able to disrupt this monitoring by shutting down the nearby comma rays, but this will be highlighted in your star map, with dynamic missions being generated to bring it back online. But this is the PvP you already know and experience right now, just without security forces. But before we jump into an unlawful system, let's explore what options you have if you pirate a ship. OK, so first up, let's discuss ownership. All ships and high-value items that you own will automatically be assigned to you. This means if someone steals your ship, you can mark it as stolen, either via an insurance claim or in your Moby. This will then trigger a dead man switch on the stolen ship, meaning it will cease to function after a period of time. But what options does this leave as a pirate? Well, you can still salvage it. You can tow it back to your fabrication hanker to dismantle it for resources. Or if you have a high enough rep with the council, our criminal guild, you can get the dead man switch disabled and pay for a new title deed to become its new owner. Also, if you're in a lawful system, you'll need to find a transient jump tunnel, as all major locations and POIs will have custom security that will scan you on arrival. OK, so with that out of the way, let's look at the unlawful system in Pyro. Unlawful systems have no laws at all, and with that comes opportunity. Pyro, as an example, has an abundance of high-quality resources and is a hotbed of criminal activity, the literal definition of high-risk, high-reward. With crafting now requiring resources, you're going to want to create bases to mine and extract them. This is where base raiding will become a new form of PvP, and it's founded on a combined arms ethos. Defending players will be able to add defenses such as walls, automated turrets, and most importantly, ground shields, a localized version of the planetary shields used in lawful systems that absorb the most powerful of weaponry. No longer can you just turn up and drop a Moab. One huge difference, though, compared to planetary shields is that these shields can be disabled. You will have to strategically assess each base and punch your way through its defenses on foot to eventually bring down the shield generator. Once the shield is down, then you have options. You want to raise it to the ground, you can bomb it from the air. If you want to extract all the resources, though, you'll need to infiltrate the base using explosive charges and hacking while fighting off the defenders. Now, both piracy and base raiding is founded on sandbox gameplay. And again, that's the essence of Star Citizen. But we want to add more. Something where you can log on and immediately find the action and fight for a purpose. So first up, let's go on a history lesson. In the early 2600s, there was a fledgling corporation called SEAL that had developed a new system-wide planetary shield technology, the same technology that will provide protection for your bases today. To prove this tech, they wanted to use Nix and Pyro systems as a testbed. With the promise of high-quality resources, SEAL lured independent miners to man the shield network in exchange for shield protection for their settlements. As a prototype, SEAL couldn't provide total coverage over all the mining settlements, and so they created 
the SEAL Tokens program, allowing the most industrious factions to purchase SEAL coverage for their work. The network consisted of multiple linked bases on the ground that then linked to several stations in orbit around each planet that then connected to the nearest relay in the SHIELD network, which eventually linked back to the SHIELD core, which oversaw system-wide distribution of the SHIELD technology. Factions could then earn SEAL tokens for working on any part of the network. They could then use these tokens to buy SHIELD coverage, but with the competition among, amongst factions being so intense, SEAL was only able to offer shielding to the hardest workers. Unfortunately, due to outlaw interference, SEAL eventually pulled out of Pyro and Nix and pushed for a more automated solution in more civilized systems. So fast forward to present day, without SEAL's backing, they had to pull out and leave it as it is. And welcome to Station Warfare. With the SEAL network still in place, but lacking resources, orgs can take ownership of these structures to gain access to planetary shield tech. Let's go! Which, as you know, would make their bases invulnerable. Unfortunately, there's a catch. There isn't enough to go around. And as in the good old SEAL days, the system still works via the SEAL token program. To earn tokens, you'll have to assault a location and then deposit resources to power the network. This begins with ground bases and ends at the shield core. Each structure occupied will then accrue SEAL tokens over time, with larger structures earning more. And at the end of each week, you must then use these tokens to purchase shield protection. With shield coverage being limited, though, the system automatically selects the orgs with the highest bid from across all shards. Meaning for that week only, a certain number of orgs will gain access to shield protection. So this is a chance for your org to become the de facto leader of a system. It means you'll be able to log on and immediately find the action and fight for your org. And finally, it's not just sandbox PvP or ganking. You are fighting for a purpose. So once you've won your bid, what then? Well, to talk more about that, I'd like to welcome Ian Leyland, Star Citizen's creative director, to the stage. Good luck. Thank you. All right, hello, CitizenCon. Thank you, Rich. Thank you, Dave. So, to continue the conversation of large-scale end-game org activities, let's go back to Pyro 3, where the ground bases were being built earlier today. This morning, we saw the small habitat being built by Luke, and then we saw Deck start to expand the base into a commercial enterprise. But eventually, we saw a massive example of an org base. But with everything Rich was talking about, with org system-wide activities, we want to give you guys the ultimate end goal. But also the thing we need to protect. And to do that, let's look up into the sky and see what it is.
Let me introduce you to player space stations. Finally, you can build your home amongst the stars. This will be the starting point for your base of operations, for system-wide org activities. But why is this an end goal? Well, first of all, to construct your own space station, it's going to require vast quantities of resources and materials, and also will be a large time investment. But how do we start? Well, it all starts with the supply bay. And the supply bay can only be constructed by the pioneer. Once it's created, the supply bay then handles the creation of the station itself. Now, we're in gray box development phase, so the artwork's not final, but let's go on a journey and start building our space base. Awesome, awesome. <laughs> so as you saw, the cargo grid of the supply bay consumes resources, and the required resources will be substantial and will need to be topped up over time. So this means orgs will be encouraged to have efficient logistic networks to feed the supply bay. And as Rich outlined with professions, it's ideal if your org is well-rounded in terms of roles, even the starter player can contribute. The supply bay has automated construction zones, which are used to create the station. And unlike ground bases, many drones are used at once to create the base. Once the station is built, the supply bay then integrates into the station itself. So here we are. We've built our core station module, and it's big. And out of the box, the station comes readily built with some core functionality. Let me talk you through it. Right on the top is the bridge, which is the command deck. This is where all further construction is going to be managed. From here, we can then monitor the status of the entire station. We have access to power and water management. Power and cooling is something you'll need to consider carefully. It also is an area to set permissions 
for who can enter particular areas, either divided by the ranks of the org itself or open to the public. And there'll be a radar station to track the activity outside the base and the terminals to access logs of who has visited the station and see what they did. So let's jump back in game and take a stroll through our bridge. Super awesome. The back of the bridge leads to a centralized transit network. This spine physically connects the entire station and will provide access to the various decks. Each level in the station will have a centralized lobby area, and this is your station. You'll be able to use the decorator mode so you'll have plenty of space to theme it however you want. And speaking of having plenty of space, this space station will have a one-to-one -one interior layout matching the exterior. No magic elevators. Yeah. <laughs> so you can circumnavigate around the entire perimeter, and it's wonderful. OK, let's jump back in. As you can see, right at the bottom of the central transit system leads to the lower areas. This is where you'll gain access to the engineering deck. So like bigger ships, this is where all the hands-on engineering and maintenance gameplay happens. This will serve as the beating heart of your station. Then we have the hangar deck. And as the name implies, this is where you'll gain access to your hangar network. The base station comes with a large hangar already built, along with two docking collars, and also empty slots for another two medium hangars when needed. There will be a vast network of internal road systems, meaning you can quickly drive from one hangar to the other. No elevators needed. OK, let's check back in.
All right, so your station hangar will offer some enhanced logistics. For example, there'll be spaces for several freight elevators. And there'll be empty modules for open ship parking for vehicles and ships, uh, vehicles and ground vehicles. And there'll be also exit points where you can simply drive out into your station. Then there'll be also an upper level for the observation deck. From the observation deck, you'll have a control room. And from here, you'll have master control over the freight elevators and the vehicle elevators. This means that even before someone has landed, their new cargo can be up into the hangar and ready to be loaded up. Now, everything we've spoken about so far is what comes with your station. Let's talk about what you can do to expand it. As I mentioned before, the station comes with a predetermined interior network of corridors and roads. And in this network, you'll find an array of bulkhead connectors. Bulkhead connectors will come in tiers one to three, which drives the size of room you're able to build. In the interior build mode, this is where you start to expand the interior of your station. The rooms will require resource and time to construct, and once built, you can rename each room, which will be reflected in the station's minimap. The interior of your station will have ample areas for you to expand. You can build generic empty rooms, and you can fill with items to your heart's content. You can also build specialist rooms where the theme and functionality is already set for you, such as mess halls or infirmaries or generator rooms. And of course, there are shops. So similar to the small shops we built around the ground base, this is on a much bigger scale. But that's just the interior. Let's talk about the exterior. <laughs> On the exterior, we have minor hard points. These are attachment points located on the upper and lower surfaces of the station. Using build mode, you can customize your station with a variety of modules which tailor it to specific functionality. Some modules cater towards resource collection, such as gas harvesters, while others are geared towards defense like shields or turrets. This goes back to bridge operations of power management. A situation may arise where power priority is needed. Then we have major hard points. The core station module comes with two hard point connectors. Major hard points are used to connect substantial wing additions to your station. The first example... <laughs> awesome, thank you, awesome. The first example is the cargo wing. The cargo wing will dramatically increase your inventory capacity. So this is ideal for orgs, who are specializing in hauling. Then we have the refinery wing. <laughs> so you'll be able to refine resources on a vast scale. As it's in space, it's much more convenient than traveling to a ground base. Now, a player could buy resources from your cargo wing and then refine it directly in the refinery wing. And finally, we have the hangar wing. So, all right. So, the bigger your fleet, the more hangers you'll want. There'll be a variety of hangar sizes as well as docking collars to help organize your fleet's deployment. 
All major hardpoint wings are connected via struts. And like the rest of the station, the struts are also internally traversable. OK, so let's recap on the exterior expansion wings. Minor hardpoints give us options on how to collect resources or provide automated defenses for your base. Major hardpoints gives us options on how you can specialize your base. Let's jump back in game and see how our base is getting on. Yes, Pedro has been working with us on this as well, so thank you. Looking cool. Customization is just as important as expansion. Similar to ground bases, you'll be able to earn tints for your station, and you'll be able to apply decals for your org logos. Outside of minor and major hard points, your station will come with two unique base expansion points. One on the top side behind the bridge and one on the underside. The top side will be for the crow's nest. Now, all the other modules built so far have very specific functionality, but I'll admit this is for the org members out there who want the ultimate in personal space. So I'm going to be flying around the verse, and I want personal invitations to see what you've done in those rooms, OK? <laughs> Super cool. I can't wait to see what you do with it. Now let's talk about the underside. This is going to be for the flight deck. 
which also comes with an additional three major hard points. The flight deck is perfect for your rapid reaction forces. It's ideal for fighters, but big enough to fit most ships. It's the perfect home for your station's defensive air wing. And just like the hangars, there'll be an observation deck which can override freight elevators, making rearming quicker and easier during operations. So an org with a tight flight deck crew can be substantially more efficient than others. Now, this one's my favorite. Let's take a look. There's a few little Easter eggs in that video. But why do you need a flight deck for your rapid defenses force? Well, if you've built your super awesome station in a super lawless system, <laughs> now you're the potential targets for others. Everyone will have their eyes on your resources and wonder what gear you've got in your inventories. And let's say we didn't win the station warfare bid that Rich mentioned. Let's take a look at the inevitable. Okay, so not only is your station a staging area for offensive campaigns, it's also a defensive fortress. The exterior of the station itself can take quite a beating. It's going to be very hard to damage. So the goal of attackers instead will be to punch a hole through the defenses and get inside. 
The optimal way to do this will be to infiltrate through the flight deck or EVA hatches and work your way up. Once inside, <laughs> yes, once inside and you've cleared out the hangar, you may also want to consider airlifting in a tank or two to clear some corridors. Raiders will have to hack freight elevators or bulkheads in order to gain access. And of course, bring enough ships with them to start hauling out the loot. Gaining control of the bridge will allow access to storage, which would otherwise be unhackable. So, as a defender, there are a variety of automated defenses you're able to install internally within the station, such as blast doors which seal shut, systems to be breached, and a range of turrets like anti-vehicle or anti-personnel. These will all help slow down the attack and give time for your reinforcements to show up. So let's do a final recap. This is one of the end game goals for dedicated orgs and will be your base of operations for system-wide activities. The station can be customized both in the interior and the exterior, meaning you can tailor it to your own requirements. And it's your very own home amongst the stars. But wait. But wait. There's one more unique module we can build, and that is the dry dock. This unique slot will be at the back of the station. It has its very own dedicated observation room with crafting stations and has a transit tram which runs along the inside of the arms, leading to the docking collars where your ship will be constructed. So the only question still remains, what sizes of ship can we build? Let's take a look. Thanks, Ian. So now we're talking multiple stations linking and dry docks to craft your very own capital ships. The ultimate end goal for any org. Okay, 
So let's take a step back. At the beginning of this presentation, I mentioned we had three types of players and one universe. And hopefully you can see we have purposeful gameplay catering to each type of player. But that wasn't the only goal. It was to build a game that connected all three together cohesively. And this is where you come in. The community, the lifeblood of Star Citizen. Whether you're a PvE player delving for unique crafting blueprints, a non-combat player mining for high-quality resources or building a base with your friends, or a PvP player fighting for your org in Station Warfare to protect your base, each one of you supports each other. You need the blueprints to craft, you need the resources to make them, and you need the equipment and protection to be safe. This is what Star Citizen is. It's a universe that caters to all players. Now, I could probably go on for another 10 hours deep diving into each system. But I do Jared out of a job, and he needs future ISCs and SC Lives and Citizen Cons. Today was to reaffirm what type of game we are making. And I hope you continue to come with us on this journey as we march towards Star Citizen 1.0.